Welcome to the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovations webinar series, Beyond the Pandemic, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. We explore why the values and practices of EDI need to be embedded in society's infrastructures. And at the core of this series are the personal narratives and experiences needed to influence how organisations, big and small, implement EDI. Our guest speaker is Nicole Helwig, Programme Director for Cambridge Social Ventures. The, the title of this session is EDI Patterns and Problems in Social Enterprise, uh, Observations from Newfoundland um, to the UK. So I, I'm aiming to, to speak for about 20 minutes, um, looking at uh, sharing some of my observations, some recurring themes I've noticed, uh, certain, certain patterns, uh, to explore uh, uh, EDI and social enterprise, and uh, hopefully to draw some broader implications for this activity um, and posing a question possibly of whether um, there is potential that is unfulfilled. Um, but I'm sharing some of the ideas I'm working on right now. Um, I have started, um, I have, begun writing a blog series. And uh, this is, uh, I'm sharing with you some of my ideas as I work on one of those uh, articles. So I'm also very much looking forward to your feedback, your thoughts, your comments, and to the discussion that we'll have afterwards. So, but first, um, letters, alphabet soup a little bit, D-E-I or E-D-I. Um, DEI, I've seen as uh, diversity, equality, and inclusion, um, EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And sometimes we get a little you know, variance. Um, sometimes the E is equality, sometimes it's equity. Um, for me, my approach is to speak of equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, which I've shortened by EDI. It's something, one of the first things I noticed coming to the UK that the word equity is, of, is often times substituted by equality, which um, I'm so used to hearing equity, diversity, inclusion. It's, it's something that um, you know, jumps off the page or jumps off the screen to me and it was something that, that stood out. Um, I, I arrived in the UK in uh, August I have been working at the uh, Center for Social Innovation since May, and I have been involved with the center since 2017. So I've been here to the UK a number of times. Still, I will uh, caution by saying, these are still many of my first impressions. Um, so I can't draw some uh, deep conclusions, but I do wonder when we see equality, right? maybe you've, uh, there's a, uh, a meme that many of you have perhaps seen um, describing equality versus equity. Three different human figures watching a, a sports match of some sort with a fence in front of them. They're different heights. So everyone is given you know, some sort of a box to stand on. All right, we have the same starting point, equality, but equity being when the fence is removed, the barrier that existed to all to be, for all to be able to participate and and enjoy, in this case, the, the match was removed. So when I hear equality in lieu of equity, um, it does pose some immediate questions. And I wonder about certain, um, certain approaches to meritocracy that I adopt EDI, and so I will be referring to equity, diversity, and inclusion um, when I use uh, that abbreviation through the rest of the, the presentation. So a little bit of background. So I've come from the UK arriving in Cambridge from Newfoundland and Labrador, which is the most easterly province in Canada. Um, I headed the Center for Social Enterprise um, at Memorial University of Newfoundland, which I founded in 2017. And as I mentioned, I've been um, involved with the Cambridge Center for Social Innovation uh, for a number of years um, <clears throat> in the role of a fellow. Um, I share this partly to set some context because the, the areas, the, the places I'm referring to in the presentation are both in the global north. They're both developed countries. I 
not necessarily a big fan of the terminology, but developed countries or rich nations, if you prefer. <clears throat> in terms of an EDI backdrop, um, in Canada, we have, uh, I'd say we are going through um, an interesting change in speaking of our different generations um, uh, um, of Canadians in terms of dealing with uh, or speaking of our Indigenous communities. Um, a process of truth and reconciliation uh, was initiated a number of years ago, and it's certainly something that we're seeing now as a, a broader societal conversation where we hadn't necessarily seen that um, in the past. That's not to say, of course, that there, are, there aren't other uh, social challenges that need to be addressed, but in our context in Canada, it's certainly something that um, is more at the forefront um, and more uh, where the average Canadian wouldn't speak to it, it's more mainstream than it, than it had been. Um, coming to the UK, I have discovered um, such acronyms as BAME, Black, Asian, uh, Minority, Ethnic, um, which I still try to wrap my head around. Uh, as someone from a mixed background myself, um, it's, it's, it's a little troubling to um, lump so many different um, diverse um, peoples, cultures, ethnicities, etc., cetera, um, under four letters. Um, so something again, I'm discovering. Um, and uh, of course, um, seeing the news from abroad and also here related to Brexit, um, hearing of uh, immigration, anti-immigrant um, um, sentiments, um, also uh, pro-immigrant uh, movements. So interesting, contrasting backdrops. But where I would link both is that both are exhibiting legacies of colonialism. Um, again, whether it is speaking of First Nations and Indigenous peoples or um, talking of, of uh, challenges, societal challenges that um, uh, are posed by um, um, people on the move, which is a uh, uh, an expression I often prefer to immigration, which comes with a lot of baggage and uh, connotations. So this, uh, the legacy of colonialism in the background, I think is a very significant piece to uh, any discussion about EDI and social enterprise um, in these places. And a little bit about more about Newfoundland and Labrador and now more to social enterprise. Um, these, Photographs um, are of fairly typical rural communities. They're quite small. Um, they uh, are they're often categorized as rural or remote. Um, there are small economies, um, and they're often social enterprises are often small organizations. Um, which, when we talk about the context of growth and going to scale has very different meanings um, in these types of communities. Um, the image of a lighthouse I include as an example of um, communities types of assets that they might own. Uh, one community I worked with owns in a small island with, uh, with, a, with a lighthouse and adjacent buildings. And that is an economic en engine for their, their community. So it's uh, quite different to the scale of a multinational corporation. Um, we do see a significant or uh, an important um, number of social enterprises that are work integrated social enterprises that uh, support um, uh, access to uh, the workforce, um, that um, um, provide employment for, for individuals who are either uh, uh, marginalized or un unemployed or underemployed. Um, and that is partly because um, of a crash in a natural resource. Um, these communities used to be fishing communities. Um, the fish stocks were literally uh, removed from the oceans. Um, we have a cod moratorium in place since 1991. We're approaching, well, it's now three years, uh, 30 years, pardon me, 
um, with no uh, commercial um, fishery of the Northern Atlantic cod. Um, that harkens to other communities on this side of the pond where um, mines have been closed or uh, factories shut down. So a similar parallels with communities that have experienced deindustrialization and where we see social enterprise has uh, come to the forefront as a possible means of um, supporting um, individuals, families and communities um, as their uh, economies have been fractured or dis severely disrupted. Now, in contrast, I've just pulled, I, had, I would like to say a handful of uh, logos of a variety of actors in the social enterprise space in the United Kingdom. Very dynamic, uh, there's a lot of activity. It's a busy space. And these logos uh, uh, represent a variety of different actors. They could be funders, supporters of social enterprise, um, uh, represent organizations uh, representing social enterprises themselves. Um, this uh, jurisdiction, I guess we could say, the United Kingdom as a place is where Newfoundland, really by extension Canada, had been looking towards as a model. What could social enterprise look like in the Canadian context? What models can be transferred or adapted? Um, and where there are cases where they cannot. It, it's almost seen that the UK is more mature, um, and that there are more, more opportunities. Um, but that also brings a certain number of patterns, which I have able, I'm pulling in terms of uh, what has already occurred in the United Kingdom and what we might learn from elsewhere, but also some interesting reverberations in a less developed uh, ecosystem, which is that uh, of Canada. So in terms of patterns, I come back to some origins and some uh, uh, raison d'etre, reasons for being for social enterprise. Um, and one is thinking about the role of the state. Have social enterprises come forward to fill gaps that the state is not filling? Or is it that the state is encouraging less um, uh, smaller public sectors and larger private sectors. Um, where where is that activity lying? Where is the balance? Where is balance? Where are the where are there shifts in terms of who is responsible for delivering what type of activity? Um, and there's also a certain trend um, which we still feel more, I think, in Canada, uh, brought more broadly than perhaps here, and that is social enterprise um, being spoken almost in a an authoritarian way, you know, top down, um, that nonprofit organizations need to be more business like, and therefore social enterprise is the path that must be taken. Uh, they will be more, therefore, more professional, but also more financially sustainable. Um, there is some merit to that, but there is also a certain uh, patronizing tone that comes uh, along with that, which uh, plays into, again, certain power uh, patterns that we'll see um, as well. Uh, in terms of definitions, um, I, am, I am not a type who likes to land on a definition of social enterprise. I prefer to be cagey and to speak at length of what social enterprise can be, what it looks like. Uh, but of course, in practical terms, um, social enterprise definitions do come into play, um, especially when um, Funding programs are being created, um, impact investment is being designed, due diligence approaches, et cetera. Um, that said, uh, what I've noticed in the United Kingdom is you come across a variety of approaches to what a social enterprise um, is or how it could be recognized. Um, so the social enterprise United Kingdom has a particular approach. Um, um, in, in Scotland, it's slightly different. Um, if you equate a uh, community interest corporation with social enterprise. And again, you have different um, uh, characteristics, slightly different. In Canada, when we look at social enterprise, there isn't a, a, a firm legal definition, um, not as developed as here in the United Kingdom. 
uh, and that gives a lot of room to maneuver. But in, I would want to say, in actually, both cases, it becomes a case of how do you navigate what you were doing as a social enterprise and what that uh, implies. I think Canada is possibly working towards uh, more concrete definitions. Let's wait and see. But my the point I'd like to raise by talking about uh, social enterprise definitions is who decides. Are we seeing a definition of social enterprise emerge from uh, from the grassroots? Is it uh, uh, are we seeing social enterprise uh, as it's understood and represented uh, in a way that um, that um, is is representative? of um, uh, and that what we, we would see reflecting equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, what I have seen in my own experience is the framing of social enterprise, again, coming top down um, from governments, from um, those who are determining funding programs. Um, there are attempts at a sectoral level but even those, I think, are playing to a certain narrative, one that still lives within um, the contemporary concepts of what a business is meant to look like. Hence, by mentioning nonprofits as being more business-like if they are social enterprises. And unfortunately, I find that this narrative plays into uh, repeated uh, conversations around business forms and legal structures governing documents around what a social enterprise is. Again, there is merit to this, um, but I do think it's worth pausing and questioning, are we talking again within forms that have, are still um, determined in a Western capitalist context, focusing on the you know, framing in, a, in financial terms, you know, framing again, um, strongly on the aspect of trade um, to the detriment of the social impact. So equity, diversity, and inclusion, and social enterprise, whose paradigm are we playing into or playing in or uh, are part, to, part of? I think the when we speak of social enterprise, the elephant in the room, the whole herd of elephants in the room is that we are uh, working within structures um, um, where there is an imbalance of power. So if we are talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion, where therefore, or what therefore is the potential for social enterprise to empower and to uh, push against or change those power imbalances that, um, that currently exist. So some of that comes from the power to decide. You say, what if we're putting labels upon what we're doing, how do we determine ourselves what those labels are? So it does you know, raise questions about social enterprise by whom, you know, who are the social enter entrepreneurs who are doing the doing, how inclusive, how diverse, and also for whom? Are we replicating uh, structures that are again top down, that um, are, um, 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 that we see sometimes reflected in uh, uh, inter, uh, um, international development aid, for example, um, who is actually gaining access to participate in the ecosystem? Um, is, it, is it simply at the level of job creation? Again, there is value, uh, but can we broaden that and see who you know, is there that, how do we get past that tendency um, to let the, the powers at be remain the powers at be? So who, if we're talking about inclusion, my question is to flip that and say, who is therefore, who is excluded and how can we uh, create conditions um, that would, um, that would rather nurture fuller participation. So what, what is the role for social enterprise um, to empower? Now, many of you might be familiar with this spectrum of social enterprise. Um, I have a number of different issues with this spectrum, uh, which I won't bore you with this evening, um, but I would like to just have a, a look at it and discuss again this, this idea of um, 
mission and money. Um, and again, uh, occurring within a system of imbalance. Um, so when we look at this spectrum, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the traditional for-profit corporation lies on one extreme, uh, the assumption, profit motive, um, you have shareholders for whom you must um, uh, maximize um, a return. The other side, um, looking at, a, at a traditional nonprofit charity, where the purpose is not profit, but a social purpose, a social mission. Um, one thing to mention uh, is what we do see in terms of social enterprise. Um, uh, is the number of women who are who are leading social enterprises tends to be higher than what we see in um, the regular um, business sense, um, and those who are led by um, uh, those social enter the pardon me the uh, number of social enterprises led by people from racialized communities is also higher than what we tend to see. Um, again, the right-hand side, corporation, uh, money, for-profit, power, influence. On the other side, um, caring uh, and social. So I wonder what, if I do this, I pause for a moment. Um, one thing that I notice time and time again, when I'm on a panel and I'm speaking about social enterprises or social venturing, um, it's often an all-female panel. The audience we speak to is often uh, um, a majority female. And one thing that, would, I, that is replicated again in this uh, structure or system is that um, while uh, almost half of new social enterprises may be started by women, the, uh, the salary that they might earn is a fraction of what it might be in the, in the private sector. Um, I have seen a recent statistic where a black female founder of a social enterprise earns 31,900 pounds, where the median salary would be 100,000. So social enterprise as we are seeing it express itself is still repeating uh, a number of the entrenched um, issues that lead to um, a social inequity and exclusion discrimination that we see previously we might see more diversity but that power imbalance um, still remains so some implications. Is social enterprise a Faustian bargain? Um, is social enterprise possibly virtue signaling? Again, I had um, um, a program called Cambridge Social Ventures. We, we run an incubator program. We run workshops supporting those who are starting and growing social enterprises. So obviously, I would like to think um, it shows that I'm a supporter of social enterprise. I think we need more of this activity. I think we need to find more ways to get more people who are driven and passionate to change um, uh, things for the better. Yes, employing um, tools of business. But it does mean that we have to be, take care of, to see the forest for the trees. Um, where is that balance? Are we seeing inclusion? Are we seeing, I think, I'd like to see us talk more about how we see belonging as well. Where can people represent, um, not just be represented, um, but feel that they belong in this community, that they belong as those who are social uh, entrepreneurs themselves um, and who can therefore be empowered to be social venturing. This also has implications, um, not just for the, uh, the sense of working within a business system, capitalist system, but looking at civic engagement and again, participation. I don't think that, or rather I do think that 
the rhetoric is often very strong that a social enterprise has a responsibility to save the world, to make the change on its own. And I think that's a lot of pressure um, and an unfair expectation to, to expect of um, a social enterprise, even a cluster of social enterprises. I think we need to see more activity in terms of involvement in, in one's community, political involvement, advocacy, policy development. It's, it, takes, uh, it takes all sorts um, working on um, social change uh, across different sectors. So a question that I do wonder um, is, uh, can social enterprise not be a Faustian bargain, but restorative? I chose this image of a forest, not just for the analogy of can we see the forest for the trees, but also because I think it evokes taking time, slowing down, and where social enterprise, again, looking at legal structures, looking at how you, you're, you set your governing documents, again, very important pieces to, to talk about. But how can we also talk about not just the financial side, but the social side. How do we give due time to developing, to building, to growing social capital? How can we slow down and listen, get to know uh, one another and change the how of running social enterprises? Not to get caught in the same old, same old of running a business, but pause and say, you know, how can we be culturally adaptive, contextual. Uh, how can representation go from being representation to being you know, an authenticity that's on another, on another level? So to conclude, my musings, if you will, around equity, diversity and inclusion and social enterprise. Again, in this particular context, I have not spoken about the global South, um, is to see whether, it, have we, in fact, a, a situation of unfulfilled potential? Are we scratching around the edges? Yes, there is very valuable work that's being done. How can that, um, you speak of individual social enterprises or social ventures going to scale, how can we scale the collective activity of what, it, what we're seeing in social enterprises? Um, how can we see um, social enterprise for all? I think there is a lot of work to be done for those of us who are doing uh, social enterprise to be aware and recognize um, the system within where, which we are, are working, to question assumptions, and to also question who are we to say that we know the best way forward. Um, let's learn what is being done elsewhere. Um, let's learn what uh, social enterprise looks like in other contexts. Um, and uh, give uh, recognition to those um, that are not, not even on the map. Um, and by that, I'm referring to the fact that you know, if we're in a business school, and I am in a business school, the judge business school, um, who, who and what is being excluded in terms of, um, can we have more diversity of business forms, for example? There's still uh, something of a hierarchy in a way where investor-owned enterprises, um, large corporations seem to be the focus and to take almost all the space. And I came from a, a nonprofit sector. Um, it's, it's, and I did my MBA amongst uh, um, corporate professionals from MNCs, as so a multinational corporations, oil and gas, uh, telecommunications corporations, um, large pharmace pharmaceutical companies. And um, nary a case study that involves a nonprofit organization or an NGO or a social enterprise um, throughout my entire studies. So again, work to be done, potential unfulfilled, um, and, but potential there for more uh, equity, diversity, inclusion through social enterprise and social venturing. So. With that, I will stop my formal part of the presentation and I look forward to your comments and questions and to our discussion.
I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Um, Nicole, I am going to kick off the questions, uh, if, if that's okay with you. Um, it, what I found fascinating was your discussion around language, and I think that kind of permeated the whole presentation, the, the, the nuance of language. And uh, we are now living in an age, I think, where we recognise that there is more nuance than perhaps we, we wanted to accept in the past. But do you think we're getting caught up in it when it comes to EDI and we're losing sight of the bigger picture, which is actually forging a way forward? Or do you think that we're not appreciating enough that there is in fact a, a vast difference between equity and equality? Hmm, it's a big question. Um, I would say that my caution would be, are we looking at these words in ways that they are becoming politicized or are we working towards them on all fronts, so to speak? Um, if we are working towards e equality, we are working towards equity, we could argue. Um, but if e equality is being put forward as, as long as you're starting with the same, at the same place, um, all is well, then, and that is being sung as a, something of a, a song sheet, um, from a, a particular quarters, then I would say that there is a, a, a potential problem there. The, the other risk, of course, is to start um, debating over the, the relative value of equality versus equity. And that's where I think we fall into a trap of we, we could end up debating ourselves to death when, as you say, there's a lot of doing to be done. Um, and I don't think we would want ourselves to be held back uh, from you know, rolling up our sleeves and saying you know, that there's 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 no time like the present, um, um, and uh, uh, I think we would need to keep our, our um, make our positions clear. I hope I did that um, at the start, my choice of, of words. But again, I wouldn't want that to be holding back um, more valuable action oriented conversations. You mentioned uh, briefly sort of the, 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 the difference between West as global North and global South uh, concepts of social enterprises. Do you think that with the, the, the framework and the structure that seems inherent within the global North, that perhaps we look at global South concepts of social enterprises and social ventures um, through a colonial lens? Probably. Um, and I, I, I should actually say, I, if I think of it, I would say yes, because my, my um, um, experience is that we undervalue uh, work that's being done in the Global South. Um, and uh, there are a variety of reasons uh, which, which could be discussed. Um, but I think what we also undervalue is is simply capturing some of that work and um, again it seems to be absent in our corridors in our in our lecture halls um, unless it fits an existing frame um, there is a lot of um, activity that um, again i don't even know that it would necessarily be the right way to capture it as a as a written case study because we again enter a, a frame of, of education, a, a way of knowing, a way of teaching, a way of understanding that is again already westernized by that very concept of a case study. Um, somehow it would be, uh, I think, more valuable and rewarding to be able to, again, meet people as people, see the work that people is doing, you know, ideally you know, visit uh, and have the time to get to know um, one thing we're considering at Caper Social Ventures is how we, because we've been developing, we've been supporting social entrepreneurs directly. You know, how could we um, look at supporting others to support social uh, entrepreneurs? And you know, we've had discussions where, well, we'd have to take care because, you know, first of all, we arrive at Cambridge University, which is one thing, um, but how do we not replicate again, you know, a colonial 
approach where we're coming with all the answers. But we can come with what we have learned and hopefully that will be a value. Um, we are able to compare and contrast. And there's certain, um, in some cases where the jurisdictions are similar enough, I think there are things that can easily be adapted. But how we would work with, um, with uh, again, broadly speaking, so I know it's gonna sound general, but with, with other contexts, with people who are coming from different perspectives, they know better than us their contexts. What value can we bring? Um, how can we be of support? And it would, uh, uh, the words I'm using are co-creation for one thing, but how can we learn in the, in, in the process ourselves? Um, I think that we have a value that we could bring, um, but it's something that we also have to be very um, sensitive to and aware of. Thank you. Iwana, you've had your hand up. Thank you for your patience. I, uh, I found um, something that you said very interesting that um, is, is something that's been on my mind for a while. And I, I'm going to expand upon it for a bit and then ask you a question. So uh, with regard to the superimposition on existing structures um, that are already embedded in society. So we're talking about uh, social ventures that we superimpose basically on existing structures that function within embedded conditions in, in our society. So we can only work within those structures. Now, dismantling those structures is um, at this point in time, uh, something that it's really hard to approach because we do not know which systems we could put in place. And the systems that we operate in are very much based on, on value creation in a pecuniary form, which allows us to live. Um, so working within this context, um, some uh, social ventures have been uh, successful in um, as they progress towards uh, pecuniary um, sustainability, let's say, um, monetary sustainability, they also um, create some sort of uh, an environment where they um, implement feedback loops and they keep learning from their communities and their mistakes and what they do right and what they do wrong, but it, it's still within the same system. So it's still a super imposition on these structures. Um, so far, it seems to be this feedback loop creation seems to be the most successful one at understanding those embedded structures. So I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on uh, which ways, which other ways we could use uh, to, to do we change the structures, do we remove them, do we go, you know, revolutionary uh, entirely and burn it all down? <laughs> what, what do we do? Uh, it's, it's funny you say that, Ioana, because I found myself saying, I think sometime last week, we need, we need reform and revolution. Um, <laughs> we are dealing with wicked problems when we're talking about the capitalist system. Um, and uh, as you say, they're, they're deeply embedded. Um, to answer your question, there are a few things that, that come to my mind. And one is that social enterprise as it is, now some may accuse social enterprise as you know, tinkering around the edges. Um, Perhaps, but it might also be a way of engaging with what is existing in ways that are innovative. Um, that's where I sometimes wonder is if it's, a, if it's better to be working in an ecosystem that doesn't have a defined, uh, a legal definition of social enterprise. It might spur more creativity, it might spur more innovation, possibly. So uh, innovation as a, as a possible um, recourse. Um, I speak, new, I, you'll hear me re, re, come back to business education because I think part of what we need to do is unlearn before we can learn again. Um, so part of um, looking at how do we change, um, not just the curriculum because the content is one thing, but how do we change um, what is being taught in, uh, in business schools, how it's being taught, if it's more experiential, for example, and more directly um, interacting with the real life. I mean, um, some of the work I've done before, I had business students who were placed in, in agencies um, as you know, wearing their hat of business students, but having to employ very different 
skills than they were learning in the lecture hall, a very different set of, of soft skills. So it might, I think that the unlearning, um, the how we are teaching, guiding, training, uh, educating, um, could use a rethink. Um, um, and uh, you know, also the, the expectations of you study business and only business. What we see at Cambridge Social Ventures is that often those who are coming wanting to start a social venture are coming because they have other experience, it's either it's often lived experience, but or, um, coming from a certain area of expertise, but they know something deeply and are looking to see how they can um, find ways to mobilize resources. And again, I, I spoke of social capital. I think that that concept of social capital is very vastly under uh, underestimated and under uh, under understood, no, so not well understood, and therefore not well um, or not taught enough, not elaborated enough uh, within the halls of the walls of uh, of uh, business schools. So I think there, if if we were to be focusing more on building social capital than you know, focusing on building your financial capital, maybe we would have more of the balance there. Um, and the last point, I, revolution, reform, everything in between. Uh, I'm a bit of a cynic, I guess we could say. I, 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 I on the one hand, um, am making a stance that I think we need to be seeing more social venturing, work for social change in a collective way, not necessarily coordinated, but in a in a uh, a way that goes reaches across sectors, um, social movements, public sector, private sector, uh, community sector. It, it's um, uh, it's all hands on deck, uh, moving in the same direction for that social change. So that's my optimistic side. My cynical side is we tend as human beings to act um, by reacting to tipping points. So we saw how um, societies reacted to the, the pandemic and how we've been able to adapt. And um, I wonder if we will ever go back to working um, in the same ways as we had have done before, um, primarily face-to-face -face when we have had a taste of what it can be like now, for example, this moment uh, online, um, or, and, and, or for example, also you know, working remotely or working from home, what that can mean um, in terms of possibly, again, rebalancing, where I've often thought that um, discussions around work-life balance um, are uh, not capturing the full picture. I speak especially as a, as a woman with a small child. So those tipping points, um, and now we're, we're talking about an existential, potentially existential tipping point in terms of climate change. Is mother nature going to um, essentially give us a big uh, whack aside the head and say, you have to stop doing the things the way you're doing now. Um, it's a matter of survival. So that's the bleaker picture. <laughs> I'd like to ask one question about like, what do you see about the technology or the AI put into the social innovation or social enterprise? Because uh, you know, social enterprise is a small startup usually. Uh, small startup without, well, with not so much resources, but um, it's so hard for using those technology to improve the over imbalance in the, in the power in the hierarchy and solve the social problem. But it seems towards the end, the technology helps a lot, but how, how can a social business or social enterprise to arouse people's attention using the AI or technology to help? It's always difficult, right? Yes, uh, I think there are a lot of unknowns, especially where AI is concerned. And we have seen cases where AI has actually, again, replicated some of the um, biases that we see existing um, uh, today. Um, I think there's a lot of attraction towards uh, AI um, because concept conceptualizing going to scale with technology seems to be um, easier for people to grasp, easier to see it, it happen. Um, so I think there is a bit of a tendency to um, look towards um, AI and technology, technological solutions. Um, 
I think there, there must be, again, I spoke of transdisciplinarity, um, referring to business schools, business students. I think it would be the same in this case um, to have technologists, engineers, computer scientists working with philosophers, social scientists, psychologists. Um, I think not only would it make a, a, a very interesting experience, um, but I think probably a more sound uh, approach and it brings some of the social that might all otherwise be missing. Um, but to your point about technology, I think we also have um, certain um, uh, expectations of what we mean by technology, you know, high tech um, computers, where uh, we might be thinking of technologies that we would look at from our past, um, things that we have perhaps put aside uh, as things have been replaced by something else. Um, I think we might see in some ways, again, as we adapt to climate change, that one way forward is to go backwards, to see what our ancestors used to do, um, to, to also add, uh, recognize the value of indigenous traditional knowledge and to ensure that that's not lost, is captured, um, and is um, elevated um, rather than dismissed, um, as may as may often be the case. And social enterprise uh, can be a, a vehicle for for that to happen. Um, there are a number of indigenous owned and led social enterprises or social innovations, if the, if the terminology fits better. Um, that uh, that we can see globally, which uh, do give uh, quite a bit of hope. Um, I, I did also want to address one one thought or one comment um, around um, again contexts and you know, in some in some places. So if I think again of Newfoundland and Labrador, when you think about a social enterprise in that context, you're more likely to most likely to think about a nonprofit, um, a nonprofit organization, um, the government there in in its own. Um, documents uh, recognize nonprofit cooperatives and nonprofit organizations. Um, so, how do you get from that kind of a frame to saying, well, a for profit could also be socially responsible? You could be a social venture. Um, to come back to what what Pam was saying about words, sometimes I think it, we we end up getting ourselves entangled in all of the jargon. Again. It can be a distraction that keeps us from doing the doing. Where I think the creativity and innovation of social innovators can come in is where they look at the, their context, where they see, okay, this is the hand I've been dealt. Here, this is the context I'm working in. How can I navigate this to achieve what ultimately I want to achieve? So in the abstract form and social enterprise can take any form. Form follows function. What do you want to achieve? And then how do you want to achieve it? So I think social venturing these days is a lot about figuring things out. What is the, the most effective, most responsible um, uh, way forward to achieve that social change? I hope that makes sense. So you mentioned about social enterprise being a Faustian compromise. And I can't remember the second half of that um, point that it was, but it, I mean, you've, you've also talked about balance of power um, and the struggles there between a rather, rather more sort of governmental or, or capitalistic kind of framework balanced or, or imbalanced against uh, social enterprise, however you want to define that. Do you think that there, there is a point possibly where, and I know you've kind of touched upon it throughout um, the last 55 minutes, but at, at what point rather do you think that there can be a compromise or, or a meeting of these different concepts in order to create communities that can make a profit but can support one another as well? Okay. Very interesting question. And uh, what I had used as an expression was virtue signaling. And um, that is because I, I refer to that also partly because what I see, um, again, 
uh, first impressions, you know, coming to the United Kingdom, but even you before leaving Canada, uh, I had begun wondering, are we reaching a point where social enterprise first having gone from not registering on anyone's radars to starting to you know, build some momentum and be you know, uh, uh, more acknowledged as a term, um, are we entering an area where we have less thoughtful, shall we say, social enterprise and we, where we enter a phase of whitewashing, the way we have greenwashing, um, so social washing. So what risk is there of that? So um, again, something to be aware of. Um, and again, conversations around legal structures and governance come into play. But I think what ultimately, ultimately we need to see change is individual decisions that are made within every organization. Um, that's a, I, I wouldn't necessarily call that a sea change, but it's less of a compromise and more of a collective um, agreement, a co well, collective understanding is a better way of putting it, a collective understanding that we can't wait for something external to happen for us to start making the changes we have to make them ourselves. Um, and by that, I mean, I, I think for example of um, um, cooperatives. Cooperatives are formed um, around certain values and around certain principles. Some of those values include self-help, mutual help, um, democracy, equality, inequity, etc. And there's nothing to say that we can't bring those kind of values forward when starting and growing um, and uh, running any kind of so way of social organizing. It's, it's the how of social enterprise that I think is missed. And if the how has values, if the how values equity, diversity, and inclusion, and puts in the hard work to make the time to roll up the sleeves and say, we recognize this is hard work. It's not just about making the space, it's about changing how things are done. So we are within a system, I think a lot of the negative sides of the system could be changed by saying, you know, who says it has to be all about profit? Who says it can't be that we make just, we, we make enough, whatever enough means, but enough so that people have more than living wages, that we have communities where we put the center uh, of the, the well-being of those communities at the heart, where all our decisions are made based on the kind of uh, environmental impact we will have that's a more positive one than a negative one. People say we have to put the shareholder, um, the pri there's the primacy of the shareholder, but I, I, I would like to sit down and unpack at some point how it is that we can say that legally we are bound to make more money for our shareholders, but meanwhile we have people who are trafficked in our supply chains we are um, causing you know, irreversible environmental damage, et cetera. So those don't jive for me. So it's, it's about values and how we bring those values to what we do, how we bring those to life that I think ultimately really matter and make the difference.